We're going to continue tonight in Revelation. This is actually part five of our Revelation study, uh, Revelation 14 through 16. And the title here, Clash of Two Kingdoms, because we really have this beautiful imagery in Revelation of the clash between Jesus's kingdom, which is coming, and this final beast kingdom that is being destroyed at Jesus's coming. So a quick overview of what we've done so far. Uh, the first week, part one, Revelation one through five, we saw the church age in Revelation one through three, the churches. And then we see the rapture in four, chapter four, and we are caught up with John to the throne room where we see Jesus and his divinity. And that's the whole purpose of the book of Revelation is to reveal Jesus. It is the revelation of, of God, Jesus, and his kingdom coming. And then Revelation 6 through 7, the following week, we saw Jesus opening up the first six seals. And as he's opening each seal, the events of the tribulation are released upon the earth. So the effects of each one span the entire tribulation. For instance, the first seal is the Antichrist coming to conquer, but his influence, of course, spans the entire tribulation period. So with each seal being broken, we see conquest, war, famine, death, hell, persecution, natural disasters, unleash on the planet. And these have been, even right now, all these, all these things are there, but they are being restrained until that seal is broken and then they break forth in full strength during the tribulation period. So then we went through Revelation 8 through 11, and here we saw the seven trumpets of God's judgment So and the two witnesses. So this so this is the first three and a half years of the tribulation where we're seeing these trumpets come out. And this is a wake up call to humanity to repent, a wake up call to come back to God before the great tribulation, the last three and a half years. And then last week, there was a pause in the chronological order of Revelation. And we saw two vignettes, Revelation 12 and 13, and they provided more detail regarding really the, the why of the wrath of God. We see the woman, Israel, and the tribulation from her point of view, from the rapture and the start of the tribulation, all the way through the great tribulation from Israel's perspective in in Revelation 12. And then Revelation 13, we see the Antichrist and the false prophet and this beast system that's coming up and taking over the whole world during the tribulation. And so we saw those kind of spanning the full tribulation time last week. So this week we're going to continue and we actually see the, chronolo the chronological story of Revelation continuing now. So this week, we're going to continue with chapters 14 and 15, at 14 through 16, actually. Now, 14 and 15, we see the contrast of God's kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus, and his plea through heavenly angels to repent and live. And then in chapter 16, we see the events of the final 42 months. We see the bowls of judgment coming on the planet that are going to come on the planet after the mid-tribulation period, um, going all the way up to Jesus' return. And so they're coming out and they're coming on the kingdom really of the Antichrist. And so that's why we see this clash of two kingdoms. So continuing here, Revelation 14, 1, and we see the 144,000. So this is John speaking. Then I looked and behold, on Mount Zion stood 
the lamb, this is Jesus, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So let's pause for a second and put yourself in John's shoes, okay? Because the last thing he saw, the last sentence from last week in the book of Revelation is the introduction here of 666. So the last thing he saw before this stark difference of turning and seeing God's people that have been sealed with God's mark, because remember we talked about this last week, the mark is a counterfeit of God sealing his people with the Holy Spirit. And so here John had just seen the beast of the final government. He just saw the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the mark of the beast in the previous moment. And now, then he looks, then I looked, and he sees the lamb and his followers and those sealed by God to belong to the lamb. So we saw these, the same 144,000 we talked about in Revelation 7. We talked about their sealing. So these are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel that have been sealed during the first half of the tribulation. I think these are sealed shortly after the tribulation begins. And these are responsible really for the multitude that can't even be counted of tribulation saints that come in from every tribe and every nation all over the planet that we see in Revelation 7 verse 9. And so these young men are an amazing miracle. And so then we continue in verse two. And I heard the voice from heaven, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpist playing harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders no one learned, could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the lamb. And in their mouth, no lie was found, for they are blameless. And so here, Revelation 14, two through five. So these have been purchased from among men as the first fruits to God and to the lamb. So we're going to unpack that in just a minute, but I think it's important to take God at what he says about these young men. First, he says, these are young virgin men. These are men that have been set aside for this very important call to be missionaries for him all over the planet. And so it's important to take God at what he says on who they are. And when we look at this, remember, you have to interpret scripture by scripture because God tells us so much about what he wants us to know um, in his word. And so when I saw this, it's like, okay, well, the buying back, the purchasing um, of the first fruit because not only did you give God in the Old Testament the first fruit of, of all of your produce and all of your, um, your herds, all of your livestock, but you also gave God the firstborn of, of, of your, um, the firstborn of the womb. So the first male, firstborn male of every family was to be given to God. So I'm not going to try to pronounce this because I'm too Southern, <laughs> but we see here this Hebrew phrase, which means the redemption of the firstborn male child. So it's interesting here that God required the firstborn or first fruit of the womb to be purchased back from him. Now, these are the firstborn of the spirit from the woman, Israel. Remember, there's the rapture, but then here we have this first group of people that are sealed 
that are born again and sealed with the Holy Spirit when the tribulation begins. So this is the firstborn of Israel receiving Jesus during the tribulation. So I think that's just fascinating when we look at this. Um, because we see here that Jesus is the first, is the first fruit, and so are we. So there's this pattern here. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 24. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam, all die. So also in Christ, all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming. So first it's Jesus who rose on the feast of first fruits. That's when he rose from the dead, the feast of first fruits. And then at his coming, we are the first fruit at the rapture. And then comes the end. Okay, this is the end now that we're that we're seeing with this 144,000. When he hands over the kingdom to God and the Father, and when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. So as we're watching this unfold in Revelation, we're watching Jesus abolish all rule and authority and power that belongs to man. We're watching him abolish that. As his kingdom comes, it really disintegrates the enemy's kingdom. And so, but I want you guys to look at these pictures here because these are pictures of the actual ceremony here of redeeming um, the male firstborn back. And so I think it's neat to see these pictures here of the exchanging of the coins for the male and this redemptive process that is still done today ceremonially. And I think that's so sweet how God has kept these, these images and these things that, that really point to Jesus. They point to the end. They point to these 144,000. And God has kept them hidden in these customs of the Hebrew people all this time. And so God instituted the redemption of the firstborn in Exodus. Everything that God does is for a reason. Everything that he does points to his purpose, points to his redemption of man, points to Jesus. So here, Exodus 13, one through three, then the Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me every firstborn male. The firstborn from every womb among the Israelites belongs to me both of man and beast. So Moses told the people, remember this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for the Lord bought you out by strength, brought you out by strength and his hand. There is this beautiful parallel between Exodus and the tribulation period in the way that God relates to Israel and will once again bring her out. He uses, and we're about to see, the parallel in this study is incredible between Exodus and Revelation. Everything that's been done will be done again. Moses brought them out then, and it is Jesus who is going to bring them out in the future. So in ancient times, God substituted the Levites for the firstborn of the womb. So he said, all the firstborn belong to me but he substituted the priest for this. This is where the redeeming back or purchasing back the firstborn came from. Each family would give five, and we know five is the number of grace, five silver coins or shekels to redeem back the firstborn son. And so this, we see this in Numbers 3, 11 through 13. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Behold, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel in place of every firstborn Israelite from the womb. The Levites belong to me, for all the firstborn are mine. On the day I struck down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, I consecrated to myself all the firstborn of Israel. Both man and beast, they are mine. I am the Lord. And so Numbers 3 11 through 13. So we see here this, this beautiful picture of what God is doing 
with the 144,000, he's showing these are the firstborn of the end. Here, these are the first fruits of Israel being brought back to him and being purchased back to him. He purchased them with his blood on the cross. And so this brings us to the eternal gospel. Because the same gospel that saves us is the same gospel that saves the 144,000. It's the same gospel that saves the tribulation saints. It's the same gospel that saved Abraham. It's the same thing. Um, and so here we start in Revelation 14, 6 through 7. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel, an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Revelation 14, six through seven. So the gospel is preached to every corner of the earth here. I think this is an important thing for us to see. Right here, we see the gospel preached over the entire planet during a right, I think this is actually chronologically happening right before or right at the middle of the tribulation. And we see the gospel preached to every corner of the earth. This everlasting gospel. Everyone gets a chance to hear the truth from an angelic voice. So here we see this very same time frame and this very same reference given from Jesus himself. I think this right here is, is really misunderstood, Matthew 24. Um, here, the same, this context is in Matthew 24. Jesus is talking about this very same time frame of the angel proclaiming the gospel. And so this, of course, is the Olivet Discourse where Jesus is, is the, the disciples asked him, what's the sign of your return? And he gives this exhaustive picture of the end times. And so here, um, 24, beginning in 12, because of the multiplication of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Okay, we see that, don't we? <laughs> but the one who perseveres to the end will be saved. And see, understand too, he is talking right now. He's talking about what happens in the tribulation. Just, we've talked about this before. Remember after the rapture, we looked at Micah 7, where all the righteous have disappeared off the earth. And there is no one to go to, to help you. Everyone is out it for, everyone is, is at it for themselves. Everything's a trap. And so, so continuing here, because the multiplication of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who perseveres to the end will be saved. 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Okay. This right here, 14, Revelation 14, 6 and 7, that is what Jesus is talking about. Clearly, this gospel would be preached to all the nations. And literally, that is what this angel does. And then the end will come. And literally, after this angel and the two angels that follow her or uh, him, because all angels are men, the, um, the two angels that follow this one, after they speak, that's the end. The end comes. The final bowl judgments are rolling out that we'll look at. And so how amazing when you look at these things, when you interpret scripture by scripture and see it in its context, it's just amazing to see what God meant by this. So continuing in 15. So when you see standing again, he's even giving you the time frame. This angel goes and preaches this right before and right at the time of the abomination that causes desolation, right at the time that the Antichrist is going to go in and say, I'm God. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination of desolation described by the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. And then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. 
And say more and more, we just see God's word stacking on top of itself. Because we saw the same time, time frame last week when we looked at Revelation 12 and the woman and how then she ran to the mountains. And, and so we just see how everything is stacking in this beautiful picture. This 3D picture starts to emerge where we can see what's happening from multiple points of view. And so when we when we read the entire Bible, a lot of times you're you're actually reading the same events, but from different points of view. So you you get this 3D picture. The multitude here who come out of the great tribulation in Revelation 7 are a result of this proclamation. Because we know when we see in Revelation 7, when he talks to that multitude that come out, he is talking about some of the things that we're about to we're about to read about the bowls. So this multitude that are in heaven, time in heaven is a little bit different than it is here. The multitude that they see in heaven is spanning the entire great tribulation. So as a result of this proclamation, as a result of the eternal, this eternal gospel, the hundred and the 144,000 and the work that believers have done for the past 2000 years spreading the gospel, there is a multitude that come out of the great tribulation that cannot be counted. Um, so it's like the work that we do is a huge part of that as well. And so this is a literal event. This angel proclaiming the gospel is a literal is a literal event. And the next two angels that we're going to look at are literal events. So the first proclamation of the gospel or the good news was when angels appeared to the shepherds in Luke 2, 8 through 14. That literally happened when Jesus came the first time and the angels proclaimed the good news for the first time, understanding this is that Jesus was what all these things were pointing to. That was literal angels. And this is now also literal angels. We see a bookend here of the eternal gospel being proclaimed that Jesus is Lord. Note, there is no reason to not see this as literal, just as the angels proclaiming Jesus's birth were literal. These final seven years will be a time of clashing kingdoms where the veil is lifted and people are literally seeing frightful and amazing things. You know, we just talked about the seven trumpets and the other events that have already unfolded. Um, we see in the seventh trumpet that heaven is opened up, allowing the unseen to be visible, allowing the ark that is in heaven to be visible. You know, we talked last week about the fifth and sixth trumpet. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure Congress was actually talking about that last week. <laughs> it's God. It, it, the world is preparing for the events that are going to unfold during the tribulation. These frightful events, um, they like to say they're aliens. They're not. They're demons. And so all these things, the world is preparing for these frightful things are about to unfold. And so what is the everlasting gospel? Because there's a lot of, there's a lot of controversy around that too. The everlasting gospel is the gospel. False gospels and false religions have clouded the simplicity of the gospel that has been constant all along, all along. Remember, you know, go back to Abraham. What did God say about Abraham? Abraham believed him and it was accounted to him righteousness. And what is what does Jesus say? Jesus, um, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. When we believe on him, his righteousness is bestowed upon us, just like it was bestowed upon Abraham for believing God. It's bestowed upon us for believing him. And so the good news has always been throughout time, trusting in God, believing God. Over time, God has revealed himself more and more. And here in Revelation, we see the divinity of Jesus made clear. But righteousness has always been 
given to those who believe and trust in God. So here we see it in John 3, 14 through 19. Um, we love to look at John 3, 16. But if you look at the full context, it's even, it's even better. <laughs> so as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. And so we see here the, the, full, the full story. You believe. You put your trust in Jesus and it is a credit to you righteousness, just as that, you know, how, how were they healed when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness? How were they healed? By looking toward the serpent, by looking toward the, the thing that was a picture of the sin. That's what Jesus, Jesus became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. All they had to do was look in the direction. And the same thing is true for Jesus. All we have to do is look to him and he saves us. We put our trust in him, not in ourselves, but in him. If you add anything to it, if you think, yes, Jesus, but that's actually not trusting in him. That's your own righteousness, which cannot bring life. You have to completely surrender. Your righteousness is filthy rags. Your righteousness cannot help you get to heaven at all. There's going to be a lot of people left here when the rapture happens thinking, but I did this and I did this and I did this, but they didn't trust Jesus. They didn't put their trust in him alone. They didn't understand that when you love him, you serve him because you love him, not because you think you need to in order to keep your salvation or earn your salvation or prop or in any way balance to help him. He doesn't need your help. He's enough. And when you get that, you serve him out of the right motivation. And so here, I just want to show that picture again, because I think it's just such a cool, cool picture because it's all just like then all they had to do was look to him look to it and they were saved. And all we have to do is just look to him. And this is throughout time because in the old Testament, even though they didn't fully understand yet, they were looking forward to Messiah and they were trusting in God and they were relieving and they were receiving salvation. So then there's a second angel. So we've seen this first angel. So we, we see here the, the entry point, um, John turns and he sees the 144,000, the, the first fruit, the first redeemed of Israel. And then there's this warning to receive Jesus. The eternal gospel is preached to the entire planet. And then a second angel follows right after. Followed saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drunk with the wine of the passion of her sexual morality, immorality. Now remember, all throughout scripture, God reckons idolatry, serving other gods, putting other things and other people even as adultery really to him. He considered when Israel looked to the other nations, looked to other kings, look to other armies to save her instead of him to save her. He he talked about that like she was a woman, like she was a prostitute. It is disgusting to God 
when we put our faith in any man or anything else but him. And so here, this angel's going and saying, hey, the world system, the global world government that has been in control for the past 6,000 years, this global government that the enemy owns every inch of it, it's fallen. It's fallen. Do not put your trust in it. Now, I do believe when this happens, the city, I think the city has, has already been destroyed. But there's still the system. The system is still part of the mark of the beast mechanism. You know, the system itself is still going to be in place until the very end. But the point here is it's fallen. It's gone. Don't put your trust in it. So this world system and this religious harlot is fallen. It's in its death throes, especially by the time the Antichrist takes power. He is going to demand all the attention on him when he says, I'm God. The heart, all the rest all the attention on him. So this is a warning not to trust in the world system. This angel is warning them, don't think Babylon is going to save you. Don't think the Antichrist system is going to save you. And so this goes all the way back to the first man-centered world government and religion in one, Babylon, the Tower of Babel, where Nimrod and Semiramis and Tammuz and the whole, that whole counterfeit trinity all the way back to the beginning. It's always been there lurking in the shadows. So we see it continued in the book of Daniel with the statue from Nimrod and these world governments starting with Babylon and going to Rome, going to what we see today. So this is all coming to an end. This beast system will be tightening its grip and the people will have to choose who they follow. And they'll, they'll no longer be riding the fence. You know, today you can ride the fence between the world and God. At least you, you can have a semblance of doing that. We have lots of brothers and sisters all over the world right now that can no longer do that because of persecution. And the entire world will be in that place. No longer riding the fence. They will have to choose. Do they belong to the kingdom of Jesus that's coming and is going to completely destroy all semblance of this one or are they still holding on to that somehow this beast system is going to somehow be okay everything's going to go back to normal so the third angel warning against the mark of the beast you have the first angel join the kingdom of jesus the eternal the eternal gospel you have the second one don't put your trust in babylon and you have the third warning against the mark of the beast warning if you take this it's over revelation 14 starting in nine and another angel a third followed them saying with a loud voice if anyone worshiped the beast and its image and receives a mark on his hand on his forehead or his hand he also will drink the wine of god's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his anger and will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image. And whoever receives the mark of its name, here is a call for endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And so here's this, this last call, and this last promise, do not take the mark of the beast. There is no redemption after you take it. And, and there's a lot of beliefs that maybe the reason that there's no redemption after you take it is because it does change you. You know, they are working on immortality and they at least say it like, I believe Kushner said he thinks he'll live forever. Um, because they they believe that they have found the key to immortality. They believe they found the key to to gene editing and being able to live achieving biological immortality. Now, I believe what they're doing is they're actually messing with DNA to such a degree that when they take this, 
which I believe is going to be part of the mark. When they take this, they're not going to be able to die and they won't be able to be, to be redeemed. And so it's going to change them. They already talk about hacking humans, getting rid of the part that, that desires God or that wants God. So all of this is in the work and we see it forming here. And so we see, we really see the bones of the mark of the beast already. We see the, the technology coming in. Um, and really what, what we see in Revelation does sound like this universal high income where jobs are phased out. Because remember, when the mark of the beast is actually enforced, you're, you being part of the global, you being a global citizen, you being part of the economy isn't going to be based on really what you do as it is who you belong to. Your allegiance to this system is going to be how you buy and sell. And so we're seeing we're, we're seeing the setup of so much of this with the technology that's coming into place, the thought process that's coming into place. You're going to need this chip in your brain. You're going to need this biological change that right now is not connected to a beast. But one day it will be connected to the beast. And that is when it becomes this thing that is a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit, that there is no redemption for him. So these three angels have laid out the final, they've laid out the final warning before God's bowls of wrath are poured out on the kingdom of the Antichrist. So here, these, these final warnings are laid out. And simply put, they're calling for people to repent and be saved by trusting in Jesus. No longer can man trust in government, not that we ever could, no longer could, can we trust in leaders to rescue. Um, there's no system to come to the rescue. You know, we see that, read Micah 7, you see there's no system that's going to come and help people. The temporary security of the mark will result in eternal damnation. And so many people will do that for the hope of some sort of normal returning, they'll do it. The mark will be tempting to people who hope things will somehow work out for global citizens, but it will not be forced on people. The mark is a choice to belong to the Antichrist. So people have a choice. They either have a choice, do, where are you going to belong to Jesus? And are you going to be sealed with him, which will mean death? Or are you going to belong to to the Antichrist and take his mark. So um, Revelation 14, 13, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the spirit, they, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. And so those that do, refuse to take the mark and are killed as a result of that, mm -hmm. die as a result of that. They, they are blessed because these final three and a half years that are un going to unfold are the worst. Jesus talked about this. Jesus talked about it in Matthew 24, 21, for at that time, there will be a great tribulation unmatched from the beginning of the world until now. And never to be seen again. So the worst time ever is going to be those last three and a half years. And that's why they're saying it's it's blessed are those who, who die before this begins. Revelation 14, beginning in 14. And then I looked and behold a white cloud. And seated on the white cloud was one like the son of man. With a gold crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Put your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come. For the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. So this, this, this looks like Jesus. It's the son of man with a golden crown. And he has a sharp sickle. And this is in line with the wheat harvest. 
Um, when the wheat is ripe, it'll bow. There's actually two harvests that we see right here. And I believe this first one is wheat. And so Israel through the tribulation will return to God and will bow to their Messiah, Jesus. It takes the tribulation to get them to see this. Jeremiah 30 verse seven tells them it's the, it is Jacob's trouble, but they will be saved out of it. So tribulation saints likewise will bow to Jesus and save their life save their eternal lives. They'll die um, physically, but they'll be saved eternally. So then another angel came out of the temple of he in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and he gathered the grape harvest harvest of the earth and threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden outside the city and blood flowed through the wine press as high as a horse's bridle. 1600 stadia. Revelation 14, 17 through 20. So we see the same event in Joel referring to Armageddon. So again, Bible interprets Bible. So Joel 3, 12 through 16, let the nations stir themselves up and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. So this is that right outside of Jerusalem here where this wine press is. And so the valley of Jehoshaphat for there, I will sit to... I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their evil is great. Multitudes and multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened. The stars withdraw their shining. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earthquake. But the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. And so here we saw two harvests. We see God is harvesting the wheat of his people, Israel, who have bowed to him, who have received him during the tribulation. And then we also see these nations coming together in Armageddon, to go to war against God's people, Israel, and against God himself, Jesus coming back. And so we see these pictures of these harvest here together. So we see that before the final seven judgments are bowls of God's wrath. And I do believe the bowls of God's wrath are spanning time as well. I think they're spanning, um, at least partially as we look at them, they're spanning the final three and a half years. As these are poured out, God gives um, God gives mankind one last opportunity to repent and receive eternal life before these before these are poured out. He warns them through the angels that the Babylonian government system and the mark will not save them, but instead are doomed like everyone else who follows them. And so, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of context because as we've been doing this study. The picture has been forming that the, the veil between the supernatural is being torn down. There are frightful things. The fifth, all right around, so much of this is happening right at mid-tribulation, this huge turning point. You have the fifth and sixth seal, which are demonic creatures coming upon the earth. The fifth seal are the locust, led by the angel of the, the angel, of the, and these are not locusts, these are demonic creatures, and they're head by Apollyon. It is the same Apollyon who kills the fur, who kills the two witnesses at the midpoint. So these locusts come on the scene at least five months before the mid-tribulation period. And then still before the mid-tribulation period, you have the four fallen angels that are released from the Euphrates and that lead a horde of demonic, uh, a demonic army on the planet. Stuff is happening that's insane. And then God opens up 
the sky and his temple is visible as the Antichrist is saying, I'm God in the earthly temple that right now people are trying to rebuild people. I mean, I mean, seriously, the Bible is so real. I mean, at the very same, I'm getting a little bit excited here, but just bear with me because last week as we're hearing all this talk about we are going to rebuild the third temple immediately. We're also hearing congressional hearings about aliens in the oceans. Guys, revelation is forming right before our eyes. We're seeing more and more how this is going to go down. And we should be excited that we are this close and we know what these things actually are instead of what the, what the world wants us to think of these things, we actually see it's biblical. Okay, so I went off there for a little bit, but this is amazing that we're seeing these things happen and we need to have a biblical understanding because the world's gonna be very confused. God gives mankind one last opportunity to repent and to receive his eternal gospel, eternal life. And he warns them through these angels through, I mean, literal angels flying in the sky, warning them. He warns them that the Babylonian government, the mark, none of that is going to save them. And so after that, Revelation 15, and we see the setup here of the final seven bowls of God's wrath. Let us saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing. Seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. And also those who had conquered the beast and his image and the number of his name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hand. And they sing a song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the lamb, saying, and the song of the lamb, saying, great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. For your righteousness, your righteous acts have been revealed. So all of this, his, he, they are worshiping him because he is so awesome. And his kingdom is about to obliterate the kingdom of the Antichrist. So we see the sea of glass. We see the sea of glass also in Revelation 4, before the throne of God, and also a worship service, Revelation 4, 6. And before the throne was something like a sea of glass, as clear as crystal. And in the center around the throne were four living creatures covered with eyes in front and back. And so we see this sea of glass is right there in the throne. It's right in the center of the throne of God. So here, once again in heaven, we witness worship of God by those surrounding him, surrounding his throne. Now, the number of those around the throne, it's growing more and more as the tribulation saints go, because as the tribulation um, continues, more and more tribulation saints have conquered the beast and his image and come into the throne room. So how do tribulation saints conquer the beast in his image? They die for Christ. They conquer the enemy by fully trusting in Jesus and not trying to do it in their own strength. You know, how many people today want to rise up <laughs> and do something that God never told us to do? They want to rise up and overthrow. That's not what happens. Those that conquer, conquer in death. And that's still the same for us. We, we may not be, we may not die physically, but we die to ourselves. We die because we are dead to us and alive to Christ. And they sing a new song. So here we see those who conquered the beast sing the song of Moses. This is an old song. It's the Exodus song from Exodus 15 and Deuteronomy 32. And they also sing a new song. They sing the song of the lamb, 
This is a new song. The 144,000 are also singing a new song in Revelation 14, 3. So there's this picture of singing a new song and praising God and worshiping him. And so this phrase, sing a new song, is all throughout scripture for different reasons. It's to comm commemorate an event, um, exp express your hope and trust in God, demonstrating a new work that God is doing, um, show appreciation and love for what God has done. It's this picture of, of a song that comes out where they are, are really singing God's word. They're singing the story of what he had just, of what he had, he's done. So Revelation 15, um, 5 through 8 now, the tabernacle in heaven is opened. After this, I looked and the sanctuary of the tent of witness, the tabernacle in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came seven angels with seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chest. And one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls full of wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. So we see the same moment in Revelation 11. We give thanks, Revelation 11, starting in 17, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were enraged and your wrath has come. The time has come to judge the dead and reward your servants, the prophets, as well as the saints and those who fear your name, both small and great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God in heaven was opened and the Ark of the Covenant appeared in his temple. And so we see here this time it's open and these angels are coming about to outpour the, um, the wrath on the planet for the final three and a half years. So the seventh trumpet is directly linked to Revelation 15, that seventh trumpet in Revelation 11. And the release of these seven bowls of God's wrath. I believe the time frame for this beginning is mid-tribulation. So Satan has overtaken the Antichrist. He's declared himself God in the earthly third temple. And God is now opening up heaven and his heavenly tabernacle that the earthly one is made as a pattern of. And we saw in... The fifth and sixth trumpets that fallen angels and demonic armies have been unleashed on the earth already. In the sky, God's heavenly angels are proclaiming the eternal gospel and warning of the futility of worshiping the Antichrist and following his system. So there is a lot going on right here. Frightful things. No wonder Jesus said that men's hearts will fail them looking at the things coming upon the earth. It, it will be a crazy time. And we see the setup now for it. Aliens in the oceans, <laughs> you know, it's, it is insane. The things that, and, and I keep hearing people talk about this and saying, you know, why don't they show us pictures? Why, why is it just like a little bit of hinted? And, and I'll tell you why, because it's, what is this like the third year in a row where they've done this big um, yeah, by the way, angels are real kind of, out, you know, thing. And then it just kind of quiets down and they come back later and say, yeah, there's more, you know, about angels, be, uh, um, aliens being real. We know they're demons, but what they're doing is they're setting it up. They don't want to give it all away because what they want is that to be in the back of subconscious in the back of the mind. So when the rapture happens and when the fifth and sixth trumpet are sounded people automatically think oh yes these are these things they told us they've been in the oceans they've told us they've been around all this time they've told us they've been here and that they're a threat so it will automatically be there as an excuse that this is not of god this is of another world and so it's all it's all set up. So 
The seven bowls of God's wrath here, the seven trumpets during the first half of the tribulation, we saw those, they only poured out on one third of the earth. Now these bowls of wrath are poured out on the entire earth and especially the kingdom of the Antichrist or those that have taken the mark of the beast, they especially affect them. This is the final cleansing of the earth and the beast system off the earth. So Revelation 16, starting in one, and then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshiped its image. So here we see that there's a direct relationship between people that take the mark and an adverse side effect here with the boil, the bowls, the boils. Um, and we also see that this is like what happened with the sixth plague in Egypt. Um, the Egyptians came down with boils, but it did not harm those that belong to God. Israel during this time was not harmed. And I think there's a, this is going to happen again during the tribulation. Israel will not be harmed from many of these. They'll be protected. Um, but the kingdom of the beast will be. And so I think this is on purpose too, to show the remnant of Israel, especially during that last 42 months. Remember, they're going to be protected by God, taken into the mountains, perhaps Petra, and they'll be supernaturally protected by him. So Revelation 16, 3, the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it became like blood of a corpse and every living thing died that was in the sea. And then the third angel poured out his bowl in the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the water say, just are you, O holy one, who is and who was, for, for you brought these judgments, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, yes, Lord God, the almighty, true and just are your judgments. And so here in um, Exodus 7, the water was turned to blood as the very first plague um, in Egypt. And so here we see the waters being turned to blood in the oceans as well as in the streams and rivers. Now in, in Ezekiel 47, we see that God, after the tribulation, cleanses everything. And we'll talk about this um, in a couple weeks too, God willing, cleanses everything from the water that comes from underneath the tabernacle, uh, comes from underneath the temple of God in Jerusalem when, when Jesus returns. And so that will go clean everything that the water can get to. And so we see how God actually heals the land from this. So this is going to span all the way through to the end of the tribulation period, these waters being poisoned. And we also see that because the saints that come out um, are thirsty because they didn't have water to drink. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and it allowed the scorch, it allowed um, it to scorch the people with fire. And they were scorched by the force of heat and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give glory to him. Revelation 16, 8 through 9. And so people are, are cursing God. They know by this time that it is God who is doing these things. And they are cursing him instead of repenting. So these plagues of scorching, the scorching heat of the water turning to blood, not being able to drink it. These are all, these are all referred to in Revelation 7 when God promises them they're no longer going to suffer these things. So we see that multitude that was already in there in 7 was multitude that was spanning the tribulation period. So the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. So they're still hurting. They're still hurting from the boils and they did not repent of their deeds. Darkness was also the ninth plague in Egypt in Exodus 10. 
So the Israelites had light then, and I believe they're also going to have light during this time as well. It said it's the kingdom. It is the Antichrist kingdom that's plunged into darkness. So it may be that those who belong to Jesus will have light. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are demonic spirits performing signs, and they go abroad to the kings of the whole world and assemble them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. So frogs also were the second plague in Egypt. And, you know, there's, of course, more here to this because these are spirits that are like frogs. But it is interesting that um, the second plague in, in Exodus 8 was also frogs. And so here these demons, they go out and they perform signs and wonders to entice the kings of the entire world to assemble for the Battle of Armageddon to where they think, they actually think they can defeat Jesus when he comes. They actually think they can do this. And so these spirits entice them and they all come together to the battle of Armageddon. So it, um, and I thought this was interesting too. If you look at the um, Euphrates here, as it's drying up, it looks like the Omega symbol, which is, you know, just, just a symbol just to remind you, God is the Alpha and the Omega. You know, he's, he is the great, he, you know, it's all, it's all him. The enemy doesn't, doesn't have a chance. So it's important here to note that repeatedly in Revelation and from Jesus's own words about these end times, there is this warning about deception and lying signs and wonders. All throughout scripture, we see the magicians. We see those that are demon possessed that can tell the future, that can prophesy and do things like that. We see this picture of the enemy can counterfeit. That's what Satan does. He's a counterfeiter. And so do not trust signs and wonders. Do not trust man. You have to know the Bible. And if anything does not line up with the Bible, throw it out. Because what the enemy does is he takes some truth, but then he sprinkles cyanide in it. And the whole thing is poison. So know your Bible. Get away from all these false prophets, all these false teachers, it, basically, anyone that's really popular on TBN or 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 any like of the really world worldly and famous people, um, yeah, look at them with some side eyes because that's usually not going to be truth. It's usually not going to be truth. You have to really know your Bible right now because deception is so high. Be very, very wary, wary of signs and wonders and prophets because by and large, they're false. And so a lot of people are going to get mad at me for saying that, but I'm not, I'm not here to please people. I'm here to warn because there's a lot of deception out there right now. We got to be as wise as serpents, but as innocent as doves. So Revelation 16 15 and 16, behold, this is Jesus speaking, behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on that he may go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them in one place in the Hebrew that is called Armageddon. And so here they're coming together. They're assembling in Armageddon for the final battle. They're Euphrates was dried up, making way for the kings from the east. All nations are now assembled at Armageddon to go to war against Israel and Jesus at his return. So then the seventh angel pours out his bowl in the air and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. And there were flashes of lightning and rumbles and perils of thunder and a great earthquake 
such as there has never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her to make her drain the cup of wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away and no mountains were to be found and great hailstones about 100 pounds each fell from heaven on the people and they crushed God and they cursed God for the plague of the hell because the plague was so severe. Revelation 16, 17 through 21. So here we see this final plague and people were just cursing God. They know and everything right here, this is the turning up of the kingdom of the Antichrist. All the cities of the earth are just then rearranged. This, this earthquake tears down all the cities and the kingdoms of the Antichrist has fallen. So these bowls are unfolding over a span of three and a half years. And this is the final judgment, a literal tearing down of man's kingdom and lifting up of God's capital, Jerusalem. This will be the center of his kingdom on earth. And we'll read other in other places where Jerusalem is physically, the cities of the, of the earth are physically torn down and Jerusalem is physically raised up as the capital where all worship will come toward. So Babylon's fall, we will look at Mystery Babylon, God willing, next week. But I believe we'll make a compelling case that Babylon's fall is more, um, is before this final scene, the, the city Babylon, at least. Babylon is more than one geographical location. This is a mystery world government and religion that has seeped into every corner of the world that we know. Every government on the planet belongs to Babylon, people. <laughs> it does. The main seat of Mystery Babylon will be destroyed earlier in the tribulation, I believe, and we're going to look at that next week. But we see there will be no place for this mystery to hide like she has done since Babel. She's hidden the shadows. Every particle of this world power controlled by Satan will be destroyed. And I, you know, this is, I think this is such a beautiful way to see it because this is the world governments from Nebuchadnezzar's government all the way through to today. And Jesus at his coming, not only crushes this current government, but he disintegrates every particle of this government system that has been here all along. He completely annihilates it, and it no longer has any, any place. So these final plagues or bowls of wrath will remind Israel of how God protected her thousands of years ago. You know, there's a reason why they're, they're so similar to the plagues of Egypt. And so they're going to remind her, and God's going to protect her like he did then. So he first brought her out with an outstretched arm then, and he's going to do it again. And she will receive all the promises during his millennial reign. All those promises, uh, her full land, her full job being, um, you know, caring for his temple and, and being that nation of priests for him. All the promises that he promised her, she will fully realize during the millennial reign. And we'll get to witness it. We'll get to participate in that. We'll get to be there for every bit of it. So we have so much to look forward to. The craziness of this day as we see it just warp speeding toward the tribulation. Um, hold on tight and stay in your Bible. I mean, I recommend just really limiting um, everything else and just let the Bible play, just get it in your subconscious, just get it there because, uh, we're being bombarded lately with a lot of deception. So get in your Bible, read your Bible, Genesis to revelation, read it in its full context 
If you're just, I know I say this like a broken record, but if you're just reading the Bible for what you're going to get it for you, you're missing it. You have to read the Bible for what he is telling you about his story and what he is doing. So that's why it's important to read it Genesis to Revelation. And I think it's beautiful to read it chronologically. So you have a picture of the full story. But um, I encourage you guys to do that. Read it as much as you possibly can until he comes and gets us. That's my plan. So um, God bless you. I love you guys. And we have so much to look forward to. God willing, we'll look at Babylon next week.